Have you ever wondered how much a single Spotify stream generates for a composer or a performer? What about a digital sale or a song placement in a movie or an ad? In this video, I will answer these questions and more by giving you an overview of how the recorded music industry operates in full. So make sure to stick around until the end and I can assure you that you'll have a good grasp at this messy but beautiful system. In a nutshell, in the recorded music industry, there are two types of rights, which generate three types of royalties and fees, and which are collected and redistributed on behalf of the composers and performers by three main entities. Step one, the two rights. The first aspect you have to understand when it comes to the recorded music industry are the two fundamental rights or copy rights. The composition, conveniently marked with the famous C symbol, and the sound recording or master, originally known as phonogram, marked with a circle P. Whenever you're listening to a recorded song, you're always hearing the exploitation of these two rights at the same time. There is a copyrighted composition, melody, and lyrics, and the sound recording of that composition, the arrangement, the production. What? Well, to put it simply, the sound recording is the recreation and inscription of the sound of a composition. The composition in itself is only the underlying lyrics and melody contained in it. So basically one composition can have several recordings within it. Let it be, for instance, we'll have an original version by the Beatles, countless covers and live versions, and all these versions will be separate recordings owned by different right owners. The underlying work, however, is always the same for each version. Forever. Usually, these rights are created and administered by different professionals and entities. Copyrighted compositions are usually created by writers, composers, authors, lyricists, and are administered by music publishers and collection societies. Recordings are mostly created by performers, artists, producers, and arrangers, and are administered by labels. Wait, hold on. What are collection societies? Oh, collection societies are non-profit organizations, usually state-owned, they implement copyright law and act as hub for collecting royalties for public use and redistributing them to the right owners. Collection societies are usually territory-specific and separated by the right they administer. These centralized institutions are vital for this system, as without them it would be impossible for copyright holders to track, protect, and monetize every music use or copyright exploitation. To summarize, there are two fundamental rights, the copyright and the sound recording. They are usually created by different professionals and are protected, administered, and monetized by different entities. An easy way to remember this is composition, think writers, lyricists, and sound recording, think performers, producers, and DJs. <laughs> So, of course, these can often be the same person, the rights, and therefore its administrators aren't. Moving on. Step 2. Royalties and Fees Bear with me as this may be boring, but I'll try to be quick. The exploitation, reproduction and license of music generates money in form of royalties or license fees. The three primary types of monies are performance, mechanical and master, and synchronization. Performance royalties are generated from the fees users pay when music is performed publicly. This can be music played over the radio, in a restaurant or bar, over a service like Spotify, an artist is performing a composition live at a theater, or We Are The Champions is being blasted at the end of a sporting event. Interesting to note that in this one example, only the copyright of the work is being exploited, as the performer is creating a new sound recording on the spot. These types of royalties are collected for both the copyright and the sound recording, by their respective collection societies and redistributed to the writers and artists via their publishers and labels. Next. What is this thing? No, nothing like that. These are basically the royalties writers and artists receive when music is manufactured for commercial use. In the publishing side, a mechanical license is basically the right to immortalize a copyright into a specific tangible form 
for consumption. So inscripting a composition on CD, putting music on streaming platforms, digital retailers, printing sheet music, etc. These are usually paid by the unit based on the territory of exploitation, type of product released, length of the song, and are licensed via a mechanical society or a mechanical hub. In the US, for example, these licenses are set by the government through what's called a compulsory license, which right now is set to $0.091 per unit sold of songs under 5 minutes. So if you are an artist and you want to release a cover of Let It Be, you or your label will have to pay $0.091 per unit sold of your cover to Lennon McCartney's publisher Sony ATV via the US mechanical hub, the Harry Fox Agency. For the master side, these are quite intuitive to understand. This income is generated from the retail sales, physical and digital, including streaming, of the songs, singles, and albums. The label or distributor usually receives this money directly with no society intervention and is responsible for manufacturing costs, digital platform cuts, and mechanical licenses expenses. Master royalties are then paid from the label to the artist, most commonly on an agreed percentage of wholesale price outlined in the terms of the record deal. Wait a second, didn't you say streaming generated performance income and royalties? Oh yeah, it's weird. Streaming is the only hybrid use of music that can be both performance or mechanical and master income based on a type of, I hate this term, consumption. It comes down to the principle of on-demand use. So if I decide to listen and download Let It Be on Spotify, that will generate mechanical and master royalties. However, if I listen to Let It Be on Spotify because it's part of a non-skippable playlist that the streaming service is pouring down my throat like radio would, then that would generate performance, income and royalties. I know it's weird, but I don't make the rules. Also known as sync, this is the coolest one. And for the sake of this video, also the simplest to explain. This is a license allowing the right to synchronize music with visual media. Film, TV, video games, advertisements, etc. For example, let's say that I'm Steven Spielberg and I'm making a new E.T. movie. In the opening scene, I want to sync Let It Be. Let it be. Well, that is going to cost the movie production quite a lot, as these fees are quoted by publishers and labels, mostly based on the production's budget, importance of the music and the project, and iconicness of the song. You can imagine that an epic placement like this one could generate hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. As sync fees are much larger and rarer in their occurrence than the other two royalties, there is no need for a sync collection society. These licenses are negotiated and paid directly with the right owners, the labels and the publishers, and then redistributed with the writers and artists based on their agreement. It is also important to note that the prices of the masters can vary immensely as some recordings are unique and others aren't. The copyright, on the other hand, is always the same and therefore more flexible, as Steve could clear only the rights for the composition and rearrange his own new sound recording of the song specifically for the scene. All right, thanks for putting up with this horrific mess of royalties, fees, rights, and entities. Let's go back to the first question. How much does Taylor Swift make from one Spotify listen? Let me illustrate this with the grand mechanism of the recorded music industry. As an example, we'll look at Taylor Swift's song, You Need to Calm Down, written and produced by Taylor Swift and Joel Little, with a 50-50 even split. Let's assume some killer numbers. 100 million on-demand US streams on Spotify, 1 million US single sales on iTunes, a placement in a killer Lexus ad, and Taylor Swift performs the song at Madison Square Garden during one of her headline sold out shows. In the US, one on-demand Spotify stream currently generates about $0.005. Usually, and I say usually to make this example as standard as possible, in the United States, this half a penny rate is divided into $0.0012 per stream of composition and $0.0038 per stream of sound recording. So if we multiply this by 100 million, we get a total of half a million dollars. $380,000 will flow from Spotify to Taylor's label, Republic. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume she signed a 50-50 deal. 
$190,000 will stay at Republic and the remaining will be split between her and her producer, Joel Little. The same process is applied to the publishing income. The $120,000 will flow from Spotify to the writer's publisher Sony TV in this example as mechanical payments via the Harry Fox agency. Again, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume a 50-50 deal. $120,000, the Harry Fox agency takes their commission, Sony ATV keeps half, and the writers split the rest. 1 million single sales on iTunes at $0.99 will generate $990,000. iTunes takes their 30% cut and the label takes the rest. As for the master royalties payments, they will usually pay the artist about 10% of this wholesale price. As per previous payments, this amount is divided between Swift and her producer, totaling $49,500 each. For publishing, this is simple to calculate. The song is under 5 minutes, so 1 million sales multiplied by the statutory rate of $0.091 equals $91,000. You get the gist, 91,000, HFA takes their cut, publisher takes half, and writers split the rest. The killer Lexus ad production company agrees with the songs publisher Sony TV and label Republic to pay $250,000 each to use 40 seconds of the song on this ad for the next five years, effective worldwide. $250,000 for the use of the masters will flow directly from Lexus to the label, who will keep half of it and then split it as per the agreement with the artists. The same exact process happens with the pub share. Finally, the sold-out Madison Square Garden performance of the song during her 15 songs show will generate about $225 of publishing performance income. How is that calculated? Usually live performance royalties are paid by the venue based on a percentage of gross revenue, which in the US is about 0.15% of the gross. So let's assume an average ticket cost of $108 multiplied by the venue's capacity and multiplied by this percentage. We get about $3,300 which divided between the 15 songs performed will be about $225 per song. Alright, I could go on forever and complicate this further, adding other types of royalties and incomes, but I'll stop here. So this killer hit, in theory and in this hypothetical example, generated Taylor Swift approximately $316,296.25. But did it? Well, yes, in theory this generated her this amount, but the detail to always remember is that it all depends on the agreement she has with her publisher and label. Because this amount was very likely to be zero dollars. How come? Well, because two reasons. Number one, advances. These are the bread and butter of big artists and killer writers. An advance is an ungodly sum of money the label or publisher offers to an artist, writer, to assign the rights of a specific catalog to them for a certain amount of time. During that period, every royalty that is entitled to the creator based on a given set of work called the schedule will be recouped against this ungodly amount. But that's okay. If the amount is big, the creator will probably buy a house and invest and they will be very, very happy. Plus, if the full amount isn't recouped by the end of the term, that's too bad for the label or publisher. The artist gets to keep it. 2. Touring the real money in the industry is in touring. A single two-hour concert can generate an artist like Taylor Swift hundreds of thousands of dollars. In the example I gave earlier, that hypothetical Madison Square Garden show could have easily earned the performer more than $600,000 in one evening. The recorded music industry, especially performance, mechanical and master royalties, is mostly an economy of pennies which are nice to have, but very few can solely live off of. Some time ago, artists would go on tour to promote their albums. Today, albums are pretexts to go on tour. I hope this video gave you some introductory understanding on the behind the scenes inner workings of the recorded music industry. If you would like a part two or more videos like this one, make sure to give this a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for more creatively explained videos.